Dr. Ellen Lake is the Director of Conser Conservation and Research at Mount Cuba Center, that's in Delaware. She taught environmental education and was the Education Director at the Brandywine and Red Clay Valley Associations. Ellen has a master's degree in entomology and a PhD in entomology and wildlife ecology from the University of Delaware, where she researched biological control of myelominate weed and how to integrate weed management techniques to restore plant communities. She has extensive experience researching insect plant interactions, including work for the USDA in the greater Everglades ecosystem. Dr. Uh, Ellen Lake is uh, going to talk to us tonight about weed biocontrol with insects using myelominate weed, which is persicaria perfoliata. I think many of you are familiar with it. As her primary example, she'll discuss conducting release trials and studies to assess field efficacy and restore invaded sites. So thank you. Uh, take it away, Ellen. Well, thanks for having me tonight. Uh, it's nice to see some familiar faces and names. Jill and I got to know each other over a mile a minute weed a long time ago. Uh, so tonight, I'm going to briefly talk about Mount Cuba Center, just to give you all an introduction. Uh, I know you are looking for field trip sites, so this may give you some ideas on that front. But we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about weed biological control, its advantages and disadvantages as a management tactic, the general process of biological control, and we'll do this through a case study with mile a minute weed, talk about the examples of the type of experiments conducted during one of these biological control programs, particularly to uh, increase the efficacy of field application of the technique, and finally conclude with two experiments conducted on integrated weed management, how we could combine biological control with other management tactics to restore invaded sites. So uh, a brief word about Mount Cuba Center, my current employer. Uh, I joined the organization about 18 months ago with an exciting opportunity to do conservation work uh, where I grew up, where I consider myself imprinted. So Mount Cuba Center's mission is to inspire an appreciation for the beauty and value of native plants and a commitment to support the habitats that sustain them. And we do this through overarching goals that include trying to inspire people to take conservation action, which we hope will eventually lead to measurable results on an ecosystem scale. So those who have uh, visited the gardens might be familiar with scenes like this. And if you haven't joined us in a while, there have been a number of changes, including new gardens added. And you can see details about that. And when we are open, we are open to the public five days a week from early April through late November. Again, details on the website. So the gardens proper consist of approximately 50 acres of native plant gardens. These are both formal and naturalistic settings. And uh, you may be familiar in particular with our spring ephemerals, particularly trillium. We have a nationally accredited collection. What you don't always see is uh, the conservation and research work happening behind the scenes. So for example, within that trillium collection, we have a new project where we're monitoring the phenology of of uh, blooming and budding and fruit set. And we're sharing those data with the National Phenology Network to try to contribute our data to bigger data sets looking at climate change effects. We're collaborating with Melissa McCormick over at CERC, who I know was a recent speaker of yours, um, looking at orchid pollination studies. So these are some of the, um, the orchid nanny cams, as I like to call them, that she designed to, um, to attempt to figure out who's, mon who's pollinating these plants. It's kind of amazing, these iconic native orchids we just don't know that much about. Uh, our nursery and greenhouse team does a lot of conservation propagation work for other organizations, helping to increase um, populations to plant back out in the wild. So for example, this is uh, Seaside Amaranth, and our team worked out methods to propagate this plant, and we provide seed to the state for outplanting each year. Uh, we also, as we work out these propagation protocols, share them on these uh, native plant network propagation site to make them available to others. 
a big change for Mount Cuba during COVID was opening part of our natural lands to guest access. So we now have a trail system through part of the natural lands that you can access. And there are um, also occasionally guided walks within the natural lands. We do a lot of invasive plant management and restoration work in the natural lands. This is a recent tree planting that is part of our 100 year reforestation experiment. And in this experiment, you can see there are six different treatments where we're trying to figure out the best methods to convert old agricultural fields back to forests. So we have uh, different planting treatments, trees only, or a mixture of trees and shrubs, different plant densities. And our, our mowing duration is because uh, we find that the biggest source of mortality in our tree plantings is damage from meadow voles. So if we mow the grass to keep it low between the trees until the canopy closes, we uh, create an environment where the voles feel vulnerable and don't feed, and we have much, much higher tree survival. So we're looking at like, where's that threshold? Where's the tipping point between say, paying more upfront for plants to close that canopy faster versus uh, the time it takes to mow and maintain the plots until you get canopy closure if there are fewer plants and they're further apart. You may be familiar with our trial garden, and I think this will be of particular interest to your group. Uh, here we are studying either a particular plant species or a genus, and we're looking at both the horticultural and ecological value in the mid-Atlantic region. We combine those results in a research report where we recommend our top performers. So Carex uh, was the report completed and released this year. And I thought this would be of particular interest to you all given your year of the aster because we have two ongoing aster trials, Solidago and Vernonia. So uh, this is our Horticultural Research Manager, Sam Hoadley, conducting a pollinator watch survey within the Vernonia trial. And we're monitoring pollinator activity as one of our metrics of ecological value. And in this trial in particular, we're monitoring this specialist Melisodes species that is um, pollinating the Vernonia. The Vernonia trial concludes this fall, so I would certainly encourage you to consider a field trip to Mount Cuba to see the, uh, the fall beauty and these two, two aster trials. Okay, let's uh, shift over to our focus on biological control. So first, I need to introduce Judy Huff Goldstein, a retired professor from the University of Delaware. Judy was the, my advisor for my graduate work, and much of the work I'm going to discuss the, today is uh, the work of Judy's lab group. So Judy and all of her students over um, about 15 years or so working on this species. So myelominate weed, Persicaria perfoliata, or polygonum perfolianum, as it was previously known, is pretty easy to identify in the field. Uh, you can see here when the leaves are fully expanded, they're perfect triangles. And the leaf midribs, the petioles, the stems are all covered with these backward projecting, uh, sometimes you hear them called prickles, spines, thorns. Let me tell you, if you've gotten wrapped up in this plant, it's a lot more than a prickle. Uh, so the, these thorns aid with its climbing habit. It can climb vertically or trail horizontally, uh, can climb about 15 to 20 feet in a growing season. And I say growing season because this is an annual weed. Another key identifying characteristic are these circular ochria on the stems. So uh, myelominate is also easy uh, to identify later in the year because of its distinct blue fruits. Uh, so you get these fruit clusters developing. They start out as green. As the fruit matures, it can turn to more of a purple color before finally turning blue. Inside each of those blue fruits is a single seed or a keen. And uh, the seeds are going to be really important to our story tonight because myelominate weed has a seed bank that lasts for six years. So you're talking about a long-term management project to try to control this weed. Uh, the seeds can simply sh be shed from the plants in the fall when it dies back. It's very vulnerable to frost, so that's what will kill it at the end of the season. And you can get these dense infestations of seedlings the following year under the previous year's population. 
You also can see in the fall seed clusters like this, where there are two fruits in the uh, ocrea here, but the whole cluster is missing. Uh, it is browsed by deer and uh, fruits are also consumed by birds. So you get some dispersal via animals. Um, also some signs that you get better germination after scarification as it goes through uh, a deer gut. The seeds will also last in water for at least several days. So uh, you can unfortunately during flooding events end up having large quantities of seeds moved from one place to another. Myelominid is native to a large region of Asia. It's also found in Turkey and Eastern Russia. China is presumed to be the center of origin of the weed. It arrived in the US in the 1930s as a seed contaminant. So a shipment of holly seed was received at a nursery in South Central Pennsylvania. Uh, this weed emerged uh, with the holly and the nursery owner thought it was interesting, might have some horticultural potential and let it, let it grow. Uh, unfortunately, the nursery was abandoned a few years later and the mile minute weed continued to grow. So there's a, a paper and uh, some specimens collected of mile a minute that are at the, at the uh, Academy of Sciences in Philly. And this paper is saying, you know, this is dangerous weed. It's spread to a couple adjacent farms, needs to be controlled before it spreads further. But unfortunately, nothing was done. So myelominate started to spread further. And you started to see these dense infestations. Uh, we refer to this as the Snoopy on the doghouse topiary. Uh, you can see again here the, the potential to climb vertically or trail horizontally and just outcompete and blanket everything in its path. So you can imagine that any native plants there are having a really hard time getting uh, light and other resources they need. So based on the way this plant was growing, uh, some additional studies were conducted, including surveying for insect activity in both China and in the US, so in the native range and the invaded range. And you can see there were more than twice as many species found on mile a minute in China. And these insects represented a wide variety of feeding gills, leaf feeders, stem borers, fruit and seed feeders. These were generalists and specialists. In the US, not only were there fewer species, but they all tended to be generalists. So my personal experience with mile a minute, the only insect I've seen cause substantial damage in addition to the biological control weevil is actually Japanese beetle, a generalist, not from the US. So when we think about specialists, think about a monarch. So monarchs only feed on milkweeds. They are specialized to feed on a particular group of plants. And I like to think of plants as having a chemical fingerprint that's unique to the plant species, like our fingerprint is unique to us as people. So it's that chemical fingerprint that is cueing the insect to feed, to reproduce, to lay eggs. So specialists are gonna be very important in our story moving forward. So those generalists and specialists combined in China are causing extensive damage to the plant. The generalists in the US are causing overall minimal damage and myelominid is forming those dense monocultures. And here's a visual of what the difference looks like in the US versus China in terms of the insect damage. So why do non-native plants become invasive problems? Well, one of the leading hypotheses is the enemy release hypothesis. So think about those 100 plus insects attacking the plant in China. The enemy release hypothesis suggests that these uh, invasive species increase in abundance and distribution in their introduced range because they arrive without their natural enemies, without the predators, parasites, pathogens that keep them in check in the native range. So weed biological control is the process of reintroducing those natural enemies, reintroducing that element of top-down control. And again, we're reuniting the invasive plants with the co-evolved specialist insect herbivores or plant pathogens from their native range. There's a, an extensive testing and multi-agency regulatory process prior to an agent receiving approval for release. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail later. 
And our big picture goal is to reduce the plant to levels that require reduced or no management and to decrease impacts on native communities. You wanna try and restore the competitive advantage to the native plants, but it's important to note that biological control will not eradicate the target weed. So some advantages of biological control as a management tool, it's selective on a specific weed and you get continuous action. So because these insects are reproducing in the field, they're self-perpetuating, you can get long-term control. They're also self-dispersing, even in difficult terrain. I think about this in particular with the work I did in the Everglades. I had field sites that were only accessible by airboat or helicopter. That was a challenge for the humans, not an issue for the mobile insects. So when you think about some of these um, problems, especially with remote infestations or difficult terrain, biological control might be the only viable option. You might not be able to get equipment or other tools into areas to use any other management control, physical removal, chemical control, et cetera. Biological control can take time. It can take five to 15 years to identify a candidate agent go through the testing process and the regulatory review process. And this can be expensive, about $5 million per weed. But thinking big picture, you tend to get a return of $16 to $35 for every dollar invested. So in the end, biological control can end up being free or cheap to land managers. Disadvantages. It's selective on a specific weed. So if you are managing 10 different invasive weeds, well, that biological control agent is only going to attack its host, so one of them. It also, again, takes time to find, test, and get a new agent approved. And it also takes time post-approval to rear and release initial populations and for those populations to increase to damaging levels at a given field site. Biological control is not a new process. Uh, it really started in at least practice in the US in the 40s, largely out west with perennial weeds of rangelands and pastures being the prime targets. When we think about the geographic area covered by some of these weeds like Klamath weed, uh, it wasn't economically feasible to use herbicides or mechanical control to manage these weeds some of which also had some toxicity issues to uh, the grazing animals. Over time, the focus of weed biological control expanded into wetland and aquatic plants, such as alligator weed and water hyacinth. And more recently, you're seeing a trend toward biological control being used to um, manage weeds in natural areas, purple loose strife, myelominate weed, et cetera. Uh, again, a visual of the impact that efficacious biological control agents can cause. On your left here, you have images of melaleuca trees with biological control agents present. On the right, trees of the same age that have been treated with a chemical uh, insecticide, a systemic insecticide to exclude the agents to let the plants grow unchecked. So in addition to the obvious differences in biomass, those smaller trees are producing fewer seeds, they're less dense, they're growing more slowly, and a really, really beneficial aspect when we start thinking more later about integrated weed management is the combination of biological control and another weed management tactic like herbicide or fire can have synergistic effects because the herb, the herbivore damage, the insect damage, can actually make the weeds more susceptible to fire and herbicides. Of course, the million dollar question is, what will these insects eat when their host plant has been reduced? And again, it's important to remember, we're talking about specialist insects that have evolved over thousands of years to deal with specific secondary plant chemicals. If their target weed isn't present, they're going to disperse looking for more of it. And if they don't find it, they're going to die. They're not going to suddenly start feeding on something else. And the testing process is very, very effective at identifying what the target plant is and potential non-target use. 
So issues of problems with damage to non-target plants are incredibly limited than the two cases where there has been extensive damage were both predicted from host range assessments. Again, they're gonna reduce but not eliminate their host. So big picture long-term, you hope to reduce that huge population of the weed down to a much lower level and have the weed and the agent persist at a much lower rate overall where your native plants have a better chance to compete. And if conditions favor an outbreak of the weed, well, the insect is still present and will hopefully increase and respond. And then you'll get that oscillation back down to a lower level. So let's go back to our mile a minute story and see how this process plays out. Uh, so we know it was accidentally introduced to South Central Pennsylvania. Uh, the current range includes about 14 states based early on on observations of the spread of the plant and uh, the, the impacts it was causing in terms of access to recreational areas, outcompeting native plants, uh, causing problems in tree plantations. The US Forest Service initiated a biological control program in 1996. And that program ultimately related, resulted in the release of the myelominate weevil in 2004. So when we think about the testing process for mile a minute uh, for the, the weevil that was eventually approved for release, we can think about testing as a filter of safety, a series of sieves where the pores are getting smaller and smaller as you are isolating down to find a specialist on that target weed. <laughs> Excuse me. So this starts, this process starts in the native range in the weed. And because China was presumed to be the center of origin of mile a minute weed, that's where the exploration started. So initially, you conduct surveys on target and closely related non-target plants, and you get an initial pool of insects, and pretty quickly you start to say, oh, okay, this insect we only see on the target weed, that insect we see on lots of species, that's probably a generalist, we're not interested, let's focus on the specialist. Depending on the system and the laboratory and the collaborations in place, you can then conduct field and laboratory experiments in the native range, or you can shift potentially promising insects to quarantine facilities in the introduced range. And there are a number of these facilities around the United States. You go through the quarantine testing process. If you go through all of those tests and end up with an insect that you feel is a specialist that doesn't pose non-target risks to native plants, then you develop a petition summarizing those results that petition is submitted to TAG, the Technical Advisory Group for Biological Control of Weeds. This is a group of independent scientists from across the US with representatives from Mexico and Canada as well. This group will review the data. They will um, come back to the researcher and say, you know, we, we don't think this is host specific. We do think this is host specific and we're going to recommend it for um, consideration, further consideration by USDA. Or they could say, we want more information. Can you test these plants or could you address these concerns? If they recommend further assessment by USDA, there are additional approval processes that can ultimately result in a permit for field release. And uh, best practice is at some point to then conduct a field host specificity study, which helps to lend more information to the overall testing process. And I'll give an example of one of those later. So this is Rhinoconomus latipes, the mile a minute weevil. Adults are only about two millimeters long. Uh, in China, it was tested on 49 plant species. This included a variety of families as well as crops. It was then sent to the USDA ARS quarantine facility at the Beneficial Insect Introduction Release Laboratory, Research Laboratory in uh, Newark, Delaware, where it was tested in the quarantine facility on another 28 species, primarily within the Polygonaceae family. And this included representatives of different tribes, sections, et cetera. So this is a visual example of how um, some of this testing works. One of the most common tests is called a no choice test. So the, the insect technically has a choice, it eats or it dies. So this is how you figure out what is in the physiological range, the range of the plants that will sustain the insect. And just to give you a visual, these two caterpillars are the same age, 
And you can see the size, the size of the frass, uh, and the feeding damage that the insect is doing on the target weed compared to some test feeding on the non-target. You can also conduct multi-generational tests where you try to establish a population on the target weed versus closely related non-targets to see if it can sustain a population over time. And look at metrics like the um, pupil weights, percent survival to adult, and how those populations trend over time. <clears throat> Excuse me, these tests are typically conducted if you have an insect that has some low survival on a non-target plant to really separate out what might happen in the field. If there are concerns about the range an insect might eventually occupy if approved for release, you can do things like cold tolerance tests that can then be used to model its ultimate geographic range. And there are all sorts of different tests that can be done to assess insect performance on different plants, including things look, like looking at the amount they're consuming, their relative growth rates, et cetera. So in the mile a minute testing process, uh, must, much of which was conducted by Keith Kolpetzer, who was a grad student in Judy's lab at the time, uh, they found that the weevil did not feed at all on any plant species outside the Polygonaceae. Within the Polygonaceae, there was minor adult feeding on a few species. Minor adult feeding is not a concern because insects are like little chemosensory machines. And one of the ways that they assess a plant is to test, taste it. So a few test bites and then no subsequent extensive feeding is a process of testing and rejecting the plant. The most important thing is there was no egg laying or larval survival on any plant except for myelminate weed. So these data were submitted to TAG, went through the rest of the regulatory review process, and a permit for field release was issued in 2004, and I joined Judy's lab shortly thereafter. So to give you a visual on the host specificity of the weevil, all the leaves with holes, these are mile a minute leaves. I've only highlighted a couple of them in red. Completely undamaged, highlighted here in white. This is Persicaria sagittata, a native plant in the same genus. So I talked about the chemical fingerprint. One of the advantages we had in the mile a minute weed system is the chemical fingerprint of mile a minute weed is very, very different from the chemical fingerprint of our native Persicaria species. So let's learn some more about the weevil. It is dependent on mile a minute for its, its entire life cycle. Eggs are laid on the leaves, stems, the capitulate, the developing buds. And within about 10 minutes of a caterpillar hatching out of one of those eggs, it immediately, or sorry, not a caterpillar, a larva, it immediately crawls to the first unoccupied node on the plant. It bores in and it feeds internally. And we know this because some poor grad student pulled all-nighters watching these eggs hatch and the larvae bore into the stem. The larva feeds internally, completes its larval development, and then it drops out of the stem or crawls to the soil to pupate sometimes leaving these pretty, pretty uh, large exit holes. Pupates in the soil, emerges as an adult. They're jet black when they first emerge from the soil and they gain this orangey color from feeding on the leaves. Again, this is adult feeding damage, larvae feed internally. The orange color is the same color if you've like hand weeded mile a minute weed and gotten some on your clothing, same compounds that end up staining your clothes. Whole life cycle takes about 26 days, but insect development is temperature dependent with upper and lower thresholds. So that can go faster or slower depending on the temperature as long as you're within those thresholds. So the weevil was uh, mass reared after it was approved for release. And uh, most of that rearing was conducted by the Philip Alampi Beneficial Insect Lab in New Jersey with additional rearing conducted at the University of Delaware, University of Rhode Island, and Maryland Department of Agriculture. 
These numbers are a little bit old, so we, uh, we should be well over the million weevil mark at this point. So why do you need to mass rear those weevils? Well, we want to get them out on the landscape as quickly and effectively as possible. So I'm gonna talk through a series of experiments that helped us to design the most effective release strategies and figure out the best ways to apply uh, the weevil in the field to increase efficacy. And one of the early types of studies that are conducted are dispersal experiments. So you wanna know early on two things. How many weevils do you need to establish a population? If you only need 100 to get started, you don't wanna put 5,000 in a site because while that might be quite impactful, it might be better to put 100 weevils in 50 sites. So figuring out where those balances are between a single large release or several small releases is important. The other thing to keep in mind is small populations are susceptible, more susceptible to things like flooding, other random environmental, uh, other events like um, a tree falling, you know, anything that might destroy a site. I don't know anyone working in this field who hasn't lost a field site to an accidental herbicide experiment. So, or herbicide applications. So you really wanna spread things out so you aren't vulnerable, especially in those early stages. So getting an idea of how many you need to establish a population, and then getting an idea of how quickly they're gonna spread from a release site. So early on, when we were studying on a very small scale, the weevils were moving at a meter and a half to three meters per week in dense patches of mile a minute. So we're talking like full mile a minute weed buffet. There wasn't a lot of incentive to move any faster because it was essentially an unlimited food supply early on. We were really excited to see that dispersing weevils were locating both large populations of mile a minute, as well as small isolated patches. So these two millimeter long weevils could really move a pretty decent distance. And as they were doing so, they had a terrific ability to find their host plant. Sampling on a broader scale, dispersal was about 4.3 kilometers per year. Again, not bad for a two millimeter long insect, but if we think about that map of where mile a minute had invaded, and that is ongoing expansion at a rate of 4.3 kilometers per year, it would take about 100 years for a release in the mid-Atlantic to get to the invasion front to all the areas it had reached. So mass rearing and releasing is really important. We also learned that dispersal can vary by habitat. So we did an experiment with um, a release of weevils from one central plant and we had trap plants, potted plants placed along a forest edge into an open field and into a forest. So we released weevils and we kept monitoring these trap plants to see which habitats the weevils were navigating through. And we found that uh, they moved quite well along edges, which is probably um, related to uh, some of their riparian habitat in the native range but they absolutely did not move into forest canopies. So our take home message here was if you have a mile a minute weed population in a forest, say in a canopy gap with a tree fall or something that and mile a minute moves into that light gap, the weevils will not access that part, that plant. So you're really looking at a situation where you wanna use physical or chemical control tactics to, to manage that population. We were also clearly interested in what the impact the weevil was having on the weed and understanding the mechanism of impact can also be helpful. So we found through a series of experiments that direct feeding by adults on developing seed clusters, not surprisingly reduced seed weight and viability, but indirect feeding, that feeding on the leaves throughout the plant also reduced the number of mature seeds and seeds per cluster. I think one of our most important contributions was an assessment of seed viability. So early on, land managers tended to wait for blue fruit to appear, and that would trigger management actions. And we, uh, through a series of greenhouse experiments, as well as some field work, documented that the green seeds, uh, green fruits, particularly when they were full-sized, often contained viable seed. So you can see here uh, in 
seeds collected from mid-August to late October, anywhere from about 35 to 80 plus percent of those seeds could be viable. So uh, by waiting too long to apply a management technic, whether it be um, physically removing the plant, which might lead seed to fall, or herbicide application, which again, there may be viable seed that falls from um, the dying vine, you could actually be contributing to an ongoing population problem. Again, remember a six-year seed bank. So you know any contribution this year, you're going to be managing six years forward. We were also interested in how weevils would behave under different conditions, including sun versus shade. This was um, an experiment conducted with these shade structures that we constructed. So we had two treatments and we were looking at the treatments and their interactions. We had sun versus shade and we had weevils present and weevils excluded. And we excluded the weevils with a systemic insecticide. So through this and other greenhouse experiments, we determined that weevils are attracted to light and they actually prefer myelominate plants grown in the sun to those that are grown in the shade. Not surprisingly, myelominate weed biomass was highest in these structures where they were in the sun with weevils excluded. We found the highest density of weevils and the most larval damage on myelominate plants in the sun. And the weevil impact was greatest in that area. Uh, they did not do a lot of damage in the shade. We observed in the field in years when we had drought conditions that the mile a minute populations really seemed to suffer, particularly when you combined uh, drought with weevil attack. And that was certainly evident in the field this spring um, in Northern Delaware. So this was a greenhouse experiment where we had potted plants. We controlled the amount of water available. We released weevils and monitored seed production. And you can see that seed production was very low on the low water treatment and the low water plus weevils. In our field monitoring at some of those initial release sites, uh, we saw in 2005, the year of release, pretty good mile a minute weed population, very low agent population. Again, the initial year, this was a release of 450 weevils at the beginning of the season. In 20, 2006, high mile a minute cover, but you can see there's this point in mid-August where the, mile, the weevil population really starts to increase and have a detrimental effect on the mile a minute population. The same pattern was seen in 2007. And in 2008, we were really excited to see mile a minute cover never reached 20% in any of these plots. So lower cover, the weevil population was also a little bit lower, but again, we've reached this lower oscillation level where both are being maintained now at lower levels. So that was really exciting to see that much limitation of the mile a minute growth. And then in 2009, Mile a minute exploded at these sites and look how low the weevil numbers were. In 2010, we started to get back to that pattern of lower coverage. So we were really curious about what the differences were in the field between 2008, 2009, 2010. Again, big picture, we're trying to understand what conditions make the weevil the most efficacious and when we might need to apply other management tactics. So we did an experiment to try to get a better handle on what was happening in terms of weevil population growth in these different years, because our off year was a very cool and unusually wet year. And we suspected that that had to, something to do with what we were seeing in the field. So we know there's temperature dependent development in the weevils with an upper and a lower threshold. We did a series of experiments to get uh, in environmental chambers in the laboratory to get a better handle on exactly how long it took for them to complete different parts of their life cycle. So growing debris days are often discussed in the context of crop pests. And essentially, you start counting degree days. Uh, in this case, our baseline was 50 degrees. So if you have a day where you hit 60 degrees, you have 10 growing degree days. 
And we learned with the weevil, it takes 139 degree days for a pre oviposition weevil, a pre oviposition period, so for females essentially to mature eggs. And then once they oviposit, once they lay an egg, it takes about 358 days for adult to adult, uh, egg to adult development to occur. So we can map this out across a season and figure out, are we gonna get one generation, two generation, three generations, maybe a fourth generation based on the field conditions. And we, we are able to pull all those field conditions from local weather stations, from uh, monitoring stations in the field. Let's put all the information we knew together about the weather those three years and the biology of the insect to create a really simple model. And we kicked that model off each year with the same number of weevils, applied the field weather conditions, and looked at what happened with potential population growth over time, knowing those degree day patterns. So in 2008, we had a fairly normal year. We had about 27,000 weevils produced in our model. In 2009, when we had that very cool wet year, weevil population was much lower, only about 12,000 produced total. And in 2010, when conditions were quite favorable in the field, according to our model, that same population, that same starting population would result in over 46,000 weevils. And we actually got a partial fourth generation before the plant got frosted back. So the take home message here is a cool wet spring and summer might result in increased mile a minute we cover, great conditions for the plant to grow, really poor conditions for weevil population growth. So essentially the plant gets off to a head start and the weevil population never catches up. So it never has the, enough of a population to exert control. So under those conditions to prevent the plant from seeding and adding a big contribution to the seed bank that you're gonna have to ma manage for another six years, we would recommend taking other management tactics into, um, into practice. So unfortunately, by the time you realize that the pattern of this cool wet spring is occurring, it's too late to apply a pre-emergent herbicide. That has to be applied before the seed starts to germinate. And in the case of mile a minute, that can happen in March. So you'd be looking at using post-emergent herbicides or physical removal tactics to manage the plant under these conditions to limit the impact of those unfavorable abiotic conditions. Okay, said best practice was to conduct a field host specificity experiment at the end of the testing process once you're permitted for field release to get more information about the testing process. This is also really beneficial if there are people who have concerns about um, the potential for non-target impacts to show them in a field setting what's happening. So we conducted an experiment with mile a minute weed and 11 congeners, 11 other plants in that genus, uh, actually, I'm sorry, 10 plants and um, buckwheat, which is the most closely related crop plant. We also included a plastic plant. So a um, plant, plant that would provide structure, but no nutritional value. We collected these plants from the field. We planted them out in a farm field at the University of Delaware in a replicated complete block experiment. And we added weevils. But before adding the weevils, and we did another experiment to make sure that this didn't affect their ability to fly, disperse, reproduce, et cetera, we uh, covered the weevils in fluorescent dust. So we color coded them either red or yellow. We released yellow weevils at the base of mile a minute weed plants, red weevils at the base of our non-target species. We let them go. And this gave us the advantage of being able to sample over time because they were visually easy to see during the day and we could black light for them at night. So over time, the weevils that originated, the yellow ones that started on mile a minute, stayed there, they didn't leave. However, within several hours of releasing the red weevils on non-target plants, on non-mile a minute, they started leaving those plants and finding the nearby mile a minute weed. 
So we have the chance now to create the perfect storm. We have weevils present. We've got a whole bunch of closely related non-target species. So we killed the myelaminate weed plants. We staked them in place so they didn't blow away. And we kept monitoring the non-target plants and looking for the weevils. And we didn't find them. They left the area entirely. A couple days later, we put a healthy potted myelaminate plant back into the field and the weevils started returning and going to that plant. So this was field validation of the laboratory tests demonstrating extreme host specificity to myelaminate weed. So what do we know about field efficacy? You know, this is our big picture goal to impact the plant and reduce its competitive ability. And all these dark spots in these myelaminate weed terminals are weevils. Well, we know the weevil is extremely host specific. We know it can decrease the cover and seed production of myelaminate. We know it can disperse to large myelaminate populations and small isolated patches. But in many of our field sites, we had declining myelaminate populations that were replaced by other non-native plants. So we had the invasive species treadmill effect. We were managing myelaminate only to have it replaced by other undesirables. So best case scenario, we had field sites where we had a few isolated seedlings being attacked by the weevil and competing with mostly native plants. But in other sites, we may achieve good myelaminate control, but the site was being taken over uh, primarily in the mid-Atlantic. Our problems were Japanese stiltgrass and uh, non-native rubus species. So our next experiment looked at this aspect of plant competition and weevil feeding. So within these cages, we isolated down to one mile a minute weed plant that was naturally growing in the site. We trimmed the surrounding plant veg vegetation in the cages, the surrounding plant competition to a height of about a half a meter. And then we released no weevils, 10 weevils, 20 or 40 weevils into each cage and we monitored over time. We ended this experiment early because even with just 10 weevils per cage, we started to get mile a minute mortality. Uh, again, the combination of plant competition and weevil feeding. In the surviving plants, we found seed production was greatly delayed in the cages with weevils present. So what is happening? Well, weevil feeding was changing plant architecture. Adult feeding on the capitulum was causing a loss of apical dominance and larval feeding within the stems was reducing internode length. And these things were both reducing the competitive ability of the weed. Myelomin, it's a very light adapted vine. It wants to get as many light resources as it can get to the top of the plant canopy and it needs that light for uh, energy to seed. So, in our cartoon plant here, we have apical dominance with all the resources being channeled to the apical bud and these lateral buds being held dormant. If you damage that apical bud, lose the apical dominance, those lateral buds can start to grow. So we see that in mile a minute here, we've got a damaged apical, meristem, and now you have these side terminals. The lateral buds are no longer dormant. You start getting all these um, side terminals growing. And internode length is usually an uh, inch or two. And you can see when you have larval feeding within the stem, you get, we call these stacked nodes. You get all these nodes stacked on top of each other very closely together. So the combination of the stacked nodes, the shorter internode distance, the lateral terminals, you end up instead of one long vine that climbs to the plant canopy and gets the resources it needs, you get these shorter shrubbier looking vines that have a reduced ability to compete for light resources. So here on the left, my element is getting the canopy, getting all the light resources it needs. On the right, uh, it is competing with mostly native vegetation and never getting to the plant canopy. And here you can see, a, you almost feel sorry for this guy, right? This tiny mile a minute seedling that has no chance of getting the light it needs to produce seed. 
So how do we combine this weevil feeding and plant competition, but native plant competition to restore invaded sites? So the last two experiments I'm gonna talk about tonight are integrated weed management experiments that were conducted in Judy's lab. So this first experiment, uh, this is Kiri Wallace. This was part of her master's work. And she did this fully factorial experiment where weevils were present or absent, again, using dinotefuron, the systemic uh, insecticide to exclude the weevils. And her native plant competition was a seed mix that included warm and cool season grasses and annual and perennial forbs. This was, uh, these were the five species in her seed mix. This is what her site looked like. Early on in 2009, you can see a robust population of myelominate weed. 2010, some hints of changes visually in the site, less mile a minute, you're starting to see the seed mix. And by uh, 2011, you can really see that seed mix um, becoming dominant. One of the ways that Kiri assessed the plant community response was looking at species richness, the number of species present in these different treatments. And you can see that the no seed and no weevil treatment had few species and many of them were not native. In contrast, weevils plus the seed mix had a really high number of native species present. And this was not only planted species, but also included uh, colonization by native plants into these plots. So finally, uh, the last integrated weed management experiment I'm going to describe was part of my dissertation research. Uh, so in this case, we had four treatments. We had a control, a low density planting of euthamia graminifolia, grass-leaved goldenrod plugs, a high density of plugs, and a combination of a low density of euthamia plugs and 25 Dutch elm tolerant elm trees. Uh, these were planted fairly close together to create shade as quickly as possible. So we prepped the plots with a post-emergent herbicide in the fall of 2008 and planted them. In the spring of 2009, we randomly divided each plot in half. One side received a pre-emergent herbicide application. The other side did not. Weevils were already present in the site, but we added 500 to each treatment block to uh, try to standardize the populations a little bit more across the sites. And then we started monitoring these quadrats present in the herbicide and no herbicide sides of each of our treatment plots. And we replicated this at multiple field sites. Give you a visual of what these plants, uh, these sites looked like about a year after planting. The high density of euthamia graminifolia is really coming through here. You can see some of it in the low density plot the low density and the control were primarily mile a minute weed and Japanese stiltgrass at this particular site. And in the elm plots, and we did install a fence to protect them from deer damage, you can essentially see the spray line here. So where the pre-emergent was applied the, the previous spring, some of these trees are already taller than the deer fence. However, on the no spray side, it's primarily Japanese stiltgrass and mile a minute, and you can barely see the trees. We counted seedlings in these plots. The pre-emergent went down a little bit late in the spring of 2009, so there are some seedlings. Some had already germinated before application, but there were significantly fewer seedlings where the pre-emergent herbicide had been applied compared to the no herbicide plots. One-time treatment in 2009, there were still significantly fewer seedlings in the herbicide-treated plots in 2010 and 2000. 11. And I think the other important thing to note is just how low those seedling counts are in the subsequent years. We were fortunate to work with the botanist Janet Ebert to identify all the plants to species in our um, monitoring plots. And while we were interested in species richness, we were also interested in relative abundance. So the two fake communities here both have a species richness of Four, but in community two, one species is really dominating versus community one where you have a much more even distribution of, uh, of the species. 
When we looked at our field sites and the numbers of native and introduced plant species, there were no differences, no significant differences at all in species richness. However, when we took abundance into consideration, it was a much different perspective. So in this case, we've summed up the percent cover of all native plants in a plot. And you can see that there were significantly higher native cover where the pre-emergent, the one-time pre-emergent had been applied compared to the no herbicide plots. There was also significantly more native plant cover where we included the planting treatment than the unplanted control. This was especially interesting because that pre-emergent the first year would have had negative effects on native seeds germinating as well. But the plantings really seemed to stabilize the plant community and the combination of the native plants that perennials that were present and subsequent germination of uh, native plant species really led to a high cover over time. So we're looking at about 80% or higher of native plant cover in those plots. Euthamia graminifolia was uh, present, but not necessarily dominant in all of the plots and higher, uh, higher abundance compared to the no herbicide treated plots where even our relatively robust competitor struggled to establish in the presence of myelominate and Japanese stiltgrass. In contrast, the Japanese stiltgrass was the dominant species in many of the plots where we did not apply the pre-emergent herbicide. The pre-emergent certainly helped to knock back the stiltgrass population in those plots. So the bottom line was that the integration of treatments controlled myelominate weed, prevented the invasive species treadmill from occurring, and promoted uh, improvement of native plant communities. We unexpectedly got access to these sites after I graduated in 2012 and in 2015. And in 2012, there was still a significant difference in the number of seedlings in the herbicide and no herbicide plots. But um, while this was not significant in 2015, you can see overall just how low these seedling levels were compared to those early years. So six years later, we still have pretty robust control of the mile a minute populations from the seedling perspective. And frankly, when we left these plots in 2010, we were feeling pretty good about the situation. In fact, we had to drop plots from the laurels from some of the analyses because the naturally occurring euthamia graminifolia population was so high that it was washing out what we had planted. It was, it was really interfering with our analyses. So you know, we'll take that for a nice robust native plant community. But when we took a closer look at the plots in 2015, it was really interesting to see how they had changed over time. So crosslands had some mile a minute seedlings present in the spring, just about nothing in the fall. Euthamia was present, but not necessarily dominant. But look how high our microstesium cover is. And this was a site with very few native grasses, and we recommended that a grass-specific herbicide be applied to the site. Waterloo Mills, almost no seedlings in the spring, no mile a minute cover in the fall. Again, euthamia was present, but not dominant, and microstesium was almost non-existent. Well, laurels, the site where we had such high populations of euthamia graminifolia early on, uh, mile a minute was back, and that cover persisted into the fall. Euthamia was almost non-existent, and there was very little Japanese still grass. So I really think about these, um, these jobs of land managers as being a combination of art and science and figuring out how to take adaptive management perspectives to deal with these populations. So six years after we initiated the experiment, one site required no additional management, one had been reinvaded by Japanese silk grass, and the third had been reinvaded by myelinate weed. So I think the, the take home message and the challenge is that sites were really value, vary and management must be customized accordingly. So our big picture, picture lessons learned, a portion of that green fruit contains viable seed, waiting until blue fruit is present to apply management techniques is gonna decrease your overall efficacy and extend the life of the seed bank.
We know mile a minute will produce more seed in the sun versus the shade, and the weevils will be more effective in sunny habitats. We know they're great at finding their host, but they will not colonize mile a minute patches and forest canopy grass. And we know that those abiotic conditions, for example, a cool wet spring, can really make a difference in weevil population growth and efficacy over a given season. So those cool conditions might necessitate additional management. There are too many people to thank here, including uh, Dick Reardon from the Forest Service who funded all of this work and the, the many uh, field sites and land managers who, as my advisor likes to say, donated their mile a minute weed patches to science and the many people who helped with the research. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, there was one question um, about, you mentioned a native plant propagation website. So for those of us who love playing with seeds, is that, is that available to the public? Yes, it is. Yep, Native Plant Network. And we would love to see that site get more attention. Another question was, um, have any um, genetic biocontrol methods using things like CRISPR or naturally occurring genetic alleles or irradiated organisms been deployed to control invasive plants that you know of? Um, I am not aware of any of those techniques being applied against invasive weeds. Okay. Do you know if there would be any regulatory considerations using um, genetically modified? Uh, there certainly would be. And the first example that comes to mind is um, as part of that review process or a similar process right now, um, genetically modified American chestnut trees are under review. I was just curious, before we go to other questions about the big picture, um, is there any like national or state level or county level even monitoring of mile a minute out there? And do you think that what you're doing is having an impact on sites that have, have your weevils been seen outside of your sites or are they having an impact out, out there? <laughs> I would say at this point um, in the mid Atlantic, I would be surprised particularly by the time we got to this point in the season to find a site without weevils. They've been so effective at dispersing. Now, whether they're present in a site at um, a high enough population level to exert control is a separate issue. Um, your initial question about monitoring is a really critical one. Um, one of the big challenges in the weed biocontrol field is there is often very limited funding available for monitoring. So while you might get upfront funds for finding an agent and testing an agent, um, often you get to the release and then it becomes more of a struggle to get funding. Sometimes you can get some funding for mass rearing. Um, and there's a great program in the Everglades that is really focused on funding the rearing release and monitoring of agents. But in general, the field monitoring is limited by resources, mostly monetary, but um, also, you know, if, if these are programs in universities and if a student completes their degree and graduates, you know, do you have enough funding for another student to continue that work? Um, that, is, that is a problem in the field. Would it be ever possible, do you think, to do monitoring with um, satellite data? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, yes, and actually, um, it's been remarkable to see the evolution and miniaturization of technology. Um, I was part of some pilot efforts to outfit drones to release agents as one way to get them into um, sites that are difficult to access. And there's also ongoing work looking at using drones to find weeds and whether um, you can you can get a different signal off of a weed when it's being damaged by an insect. So you could even detect whether agents are possible if you can you know, essentially get the algorithms working properly. So um, I worked with collaborators who did all that math magic. But there are <laughs> definitely projects looking at using drones. And as the drones are able to fly larger distances as well, and as those um, imaging techniques get down to smaller and smaller scale, whether from drone or from satellite, um, you can get impressive resolution on the ground. Mm. Yeah, and I would, I would think with mile a minute that it would be a large enough footprint that you could, there might have a vegetate, uh, yeah. 
especially if you get something that throws a different chemical signal that you can train the sensors to detect you. Yeah, nice. Someone asked, what can state governments do to complement the work on biocontrols that are funded by federal agencies? So what could Maryland do to um, we try to prompt our government to do? Well, Maryland Department of Agriculture has done a lot of rearing and releasing, and I believe also some monitoring in the case of myelinate weed. Mm. But certainly, you know, advocating for the use of these sites for having protected nursery sites where the populations can grow and not be treated by herbicide can be important. Do you have a rough idea of how many different uh, biological controls, uh, in, uh, insect biological controls have been released to control invasive plants? Oh, I don't have that number off the top of my head, but um, one of the things that you can find a, a complete PDF of the book is uh, a field guide to weed biocontrol in Eastern North America. And that'll get you a description, detailed description of every plant and agent that combination in Eastern North America. Would you guess it's in the hundreds, the dozens? I'd say in between. Okay. All right. Interesting. Um, oh, someone, uh, Michael, I think this was a Michael question, Michael Wilpers. What other Asian um, vines might we see um, an insect biocontrol release in Maryland? In the um, I don't know if there's something like being tested that hasn't reached a public tag petition phase yet. Um, certainly the most recent releases that come to mind are north and south of us. So um, the vincitoxicum system further north, uh, the swallowworts, there's an agent uh, recently released on those. And unfortunately, that is making its way south. Um, and in more of the south and southeastern U.S., so Florida and the southeastern U.S. air potato, is a target with two different um, chrysomelid beetles approved for release. And um, the target system I worked on, Old World Climbing Fern, Ligodium microfilum, also has several insects and um, another in review that would also attack Ligodium japonicum, which is more of a so, problem in the southeastern US. Uh, Prue, do you mind if I, I follow up quickly? So Ellen, are you saying that there's nothing in the works, even from the beginning stages for, you know, porcelain berry and Chinese wisteria and uh, Japanese honeysuckle and oriental bittersweet and et cetera? Um, not that I am aware of, but that's not to say that there isn't a lab working on it that hasn't published something yet that like isn't at the point yet where it would be more consumable information. I haven't heard of anything either. You know, there's Japanese knotweed and then everything else is just, I haven't heard of any other projects. And I will say another cause for concern, in my personal opinion, is um, we've had some really prominent biological control scientists retire over the last couple of years, and those faculty lines at the universities were not replaced with new biocontrol scientists. So um, again, there's an upfront cost to this, but the long-term benefit is um, really high and it's a shame to not see more investment in this work and that's certainly something that you know could be advocated for. It seems like a very powerful technique and it, it's so encouraging to hear about so I'm sorry right. to hear you're not getting funded at the levels you should be. Yeah. Um, and I we're almost uh, at a wrap here just to let people know if you have a one last burning question you have to be quick but um, I wanted to ask a how you think climate change might be impacting specifically mile a minute biological control. Um, you have any thoughts about that? Um, so I don't have any data to support this. I would say it could expand the range that the weed could ultimately colonize. It is undergoing range expansion. Um, whether Climate change, when we think about the temperature dependent development, helps those weevil populations build potentially. But, you know, you could have some population growth towards the north, but maybe have conditions become unfavorable in more of the southern part of the range. But that's purely conjecture. 
And a quick follow-up, is there a map that shows where the plant is and where the weevils are and how they overlap? Um, I will have to think about if I can find a generalized map on that. That is also a bit of a challenge, especially early on in programs. Uh, we're reluctant to publicize that information, especially if they're mm. field nurseries where we let populations build and then collect mm. insects for redistribution yeah. because um, then in, in Florida in particular, the air potato beetle was charismatic microfauna, this beautiful red beetle. It was incredibly effective. And um, the public was certainly accessing and collecting beetles from field sites, which limited some of our distribution and research efforts. Interesting. All right, so, thank you. Judy, I guess you get the last one. Uh, I believe this uh, book was referred to. This is the uh, field guide for the biological uh, control of weeds. And I've put the link uh, into the chat. Uh, and in addition, uh, I just wanted to make a side comment that for uh, Japanese knotweed, the um, work by the Department of Ag, Maryland Department of Ag on that, um, has been financed uh, by a grant, and that is just about over with, and they're looking for additional grants. Hopefully, they'll get that because without the uh, money, they can't continue the work. Okay, thank you, Judy. Well, um, I think we just need to thank Ellen for such an incredibly good talk. That was really, really well done. It was an excellent talk. So how about a round of applause? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of really great comments in the chat box too. So, so uh, thank you all for participating tonight and have a good rest of your July, which is almost gone. But uh, thanks again, Ellen. It was really great. Thank you. Okay, Bye. take care.